Hi, so um, I, I'm Paul Newman and I'm a director of the Oxford Robotics Institute and um, also uh, BP Chair of Information Engineering, uh, which means I've got the sort of the one of the best jobs in the world. And I also founded and am CTO of a scale up company in robotics and autonomy. So I really do have quite an, an extraordinary life. So I'm Perla Maiolino, I'm an associate professor at the engineering science department. And uh, uh, I'm establishing my new soft robotics lab at the Oxford Robotics Institute. My name is Lars Kunz. I'm a departmental lecturer at the Oxford Robotics Institute. And I'm also a stipendiary um, lecturer in computer science at Keegan College. And currently I'm leading the Cognitive Robotics Group at the OI. I, I think we're gonna change how we make machines, right? So um, uh, I think soft robotics is gonna be huge. Um, I think the actual, the, the, uh, if you like, the phenotype of the machines is wrong at the moment and that's sort of from how we used to be able to make stuff and we can make things differently now so i think soft robotics um embedded sensing in that is i think it's going to be absolutely huge i think there are huge questions about data provenance so yes we have machines that learn and we're going to have machines that learn more and more better and better faster and faster from less and less data over the next decades um, but how it means those, the, the provenance of, and the trust of where that learning comes from and the data that's used to teach them, um, I think that's going to be a, a big topic. And I think that's not going to just, just not just going to belong to, to robotics as well. I think that the sensors that we use will look pathetic. The ones that we have now will look pathetic. I mean, the cameras will get better. Um, I think we'll have different forms of sensing. Um, I think right now radar is important, but I think it's going to become like cameras in time. I think we'll sort that out. So persistence, I think, is going to be a, um, a really important thing. Like, you know, you can't change the batteries on them and things like that. These things are going to have to be sort of self-dependent and be able to operate really by themselves for a long time, whether that is powering themselves or alternative, you know, fuel sources. I think that's going to be important. I think energy usage is going to become important. I think actuation will change. And again, I think that comes into the into the soft robotics. Um, I think uh, learning from very small data sets um, is important, maybe. The other thing is that actually, um, uh, you know, that you don't have to start learning from scratch on all machines. So, you know, if you take transfer learning to where it should really go to, uh, I think that will get quite interesting as we start to not have to reset every time you build a new machine. Um, I mean, my two big uh, passion are about uh, tactile sensing technologies and soft robotics. Tactile sensing is, so sense of touch is uh, something that uh, uh, humans uh, use uh, uh, continuously uh, to actually interact with the, with the environment. However, it's not uh, so common in our uh, uh, robots from one point of view. Um, I would like to provide robots with sense of touch because this uh, enables them to safely interact with us and uh, learn about the world. Uh, from the other point of view, I want to use robotics to better understand the biological or, uh, mechanisms that are uh, behind the, the sense of touch. Um, I believe that soft robotics at the moment uh, uh, is uh, um, something that uh, really looks into the future of robotics because uh, we are starting to consider uh, uh, compliance in the robot bodies, taking inspiration from uh, um, biological organisms that uh, have this compliant and use it for uh, address the challenges to, of unconstrained and uh, very dynamic uh, environments. It's very multidisciplinary, so it requires, uh, uh, of course, uh, expertise from many, many areas, um, uh, material science, uh, uh, biology, um, 3D printing, so additive manufacturing, uh, um, uh, chemistry, and uh, this is very exciting because uh, um, require uh, the, the interconnection of uh, um, a lot of different expertise. So I see a future in which we don't uh, have only rigid robots, but we have uh, um, this uh, amazing synergy between uh, rigid and soft, uh, soft robots to actually be able to uh, 
um, deploy robots in, uh, in our environments uh, and uh, to be able to safely uh, interact with us. So I'm particularly excited about robots that interact with humans in meaningful ways. And um, so robot platforms are much more mature now and they can interact with people in everyday environments. <clears throat> and what this requires is that these robots actually understand uh, what is around them. So they need to interpret what they're seeing. They need to assess the current situation. And they also um, need to be able to explain what they're seeing and what they're assessing to people. And so this is something I'm really interested in. And this is exactly what we're doing currently in the um, SEX project. So SEX stands for Sense, Assess, Explain. That's part of the Assuring Autonomy International Program. So there we look at um, autonomous driving in on-road and off-road scenarios. And we are particularly interested in interpreting, for example, the surface of the environment, um, <clears> then <throat> assessing, for example, the traversability of routes on these surfaces, and then trying to explain to, to passengers in the vehicle kind of which routes are feasible or infeasible because of certain reasons. So giving reason is, uh, why this is possible. So this also involves some causal reasoning, and this is what I'm particularly interested in. I'm very interested and excited about explainable autonomy. So this is really a, a long-term vision where we want to look in, into um, allowing systems to explain themselves to different types of users. Uh, this could be end users, this could be developers, but this could be also system auditors who ensure kind of the safety of the system or who do some accident investigation, for example. I think that is really something that interests me. And in order to enable robots or allow them to explain themselves, they really need to have an understanding of the environment. They have a, need to have a good understanding of their own capabilities, what they can achieve in, in this environment. And they also need different reasoning methods uh, to make predictions about the future, uh, but also explain their observations. Um, and I think this requires a lot of different forms of reasoning. In particular, I'm excited about causal reasoning, where you think about, for example, what will happen if I carry out a certain action, right? So if I, uh, I'm sitting in a car and the car takes a certain direction, there are obviously some consequences of that. And I'm really interested in kind of uh, reasoning, uh, naming systems to reason about these possible consequences, for example. I think for students in the school, I, I would suggest kind of lots of reading about robotics, um, problem solving and math. So as kind of the basic background, um, but also definitely get into coding. So I think that's really important. So there are great uh, coding programs like Code Club um, uh, interface or kind of visual programming languages like Scratch, which really help and kind of really uh, easy to get you into programming. And then you can uh, build on that. So I think that is something really important. And you can even start with, for example, something like Lego Mindstorms, uh, building actually small kind of robot systems and program them using these languages. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. And for undergrads, I think it's really important to yeah, do maybe internships, kind of, for example, in robotics groups like ours, um, in companies that work on actual hardware platforms. And I think. Also, if you have the chance to join a robotic club or kind of a robot team uh, that takes part in robot competition, I think that would be really helpful. For example, we at OI have the uh, student-driven robot cup team uh, that takes part in this uh, robot cup competition. So I think that is really helpful trying to understand the most difficult part of robotics in terms of integration uh, of different aspects uh, of the system, for example, perception, bringing perception and action together. So I think that's, that's really valuable. Um, I believe the first thing is to be curious and to, to not be afraid of making, doing, so to actually explore, um, even with the small projects. Um, so when I started to be uh, excited about robotics. Actually, uh, I was uh, at a high school, so uh, 
uh, even before to, 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 to start <laughs> the university. And uh, I was trying to uh, build my own uh, small mobile robots. And uh, mm, I believe that that uh, is important. So the fact that you, 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 you try to be uh, proactive in uh, um, exploring what exists and like trying to make it in place. Uh, so there are around uh, a lot of uh, uh, projects that can be uh, tried. Uh, we, of course, uh, now it is possible very easily to, to use the um, Arduino, Raspberry Pi. So I, I believe that uh, um, they can start to, to explore what exists and, uh, and, and learn by, by doing. So curiosity and, uh, and try actually to, to work on it, I believe is, is the first things. But there's one thing that I would advise that you should do. Make, make, just program, try and build systems. If you, you know, so not everyone is a systems builder and not everyone will value what you do if you're building systems, right? Because it is easier to write things in MATLAB and rush for that next paper. That never attracted me in doing that. When I was out at MIT, I didn't write a paper for two years, okay? I'm not saying don't write papers, that is not my advice. But what I did when I was at MIT is I will build big systems and I will learn how to do that. And then I cashed that all in the end and there were loads of papers and there were loads of interesting things because I was able to get to places that other people couldn't get. Now for me personally, that's just, it's always been important. I've never, I've never gone for a walk around a park and gone, I'm gonna ask a big lofty question. I've always been the inverse of that. I've said, I want a machine to be able to do this. I think it should be able to do that. Try and build it. And in trying to build it, I get pointed very quickly at the stuff I can't do yet. So back in the day, it was a uh, really epic synchronization of timestamps between sensors whose times were drifting because of the temperature change. There might've been some calibration stuff. There was loop closing. Like how do you just recognize you're back at the same place without doing that metrically? There's all kinds of problems in scaling with SLAM. There's now dealing with weather, because actually if you say, well, I'm gonna go out, and I decided I was gonna go out at 10 o'clock on Thursday, and it's pouring with rain, you can't work in rain. Well, that's a bit embarrassing, right? And it's dark half the time. Like exactly half the time outside, it is dark. So go out, figure out how to do that. That for me has always been what's interesting um, is trying to build unwieldy big systems where people go, oh, why are you trying to do that in university? Because building and making is what roboticists do and the best robotics groups around the world, they build systems and those systems tell them what the hard problems to be solved are. It is harder than doing it other ways and, um, uh, and simpler ways and building throwaway things. And I think we need to be careful in a time where it's so easy to quickly put papers up on archive, there's this real pressure. My advice as a roboticist is don't scrimp during your PhD on the building bit. Because when you're out there, that's the bit that is super, super rare. And if you're like me, it brings so much joy when you've been there, you've done the mathematics, you've done the algorithms, you've put it all together and you brought the whole system together and the whole system has to fit in not much CPU. You don't have infinite CPU and You've got to make a decision every 50 milliseconds. You just do, because it's two tons of metal. But when you bring all that together and you see something moving off that weighs many, 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 many tons or diving below the ocean and you're not going to hear from it for two hours and you have to sit there on the deck really hoping it comes back, that is an extraordinary experience. And I think, I think people that can build machines like that and learn to do that as a, as a researcher and then go on are super, super rare and you'll have a very happy life. And I'm a particular kind of engineer for doing that, but that is what I love doing. There's just nothing like writing some text files and having a big machine move off and do it. And in trying to deploy it, you will be told unequivocally actually what the big problem is. And I don't think you get the big problem by walking around a park. That's me. <laughs>